welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and I'm so glad you've joined me. Um, Life. Yeah, life. When you let yourself get really quiet. You find that you see the cycles and you see the ways you can move and pivot. And then you become less afraid. And then you become more curious. And I think that's the beginning of you becoming more spiritual. And the more you tap into becoming more spiritual, the more you will recognize that you are a spiritual being, having human experiences. And now it's just a matter of living in those experiences more fully. Welcome to your life. Bountiful life. John Peel Bishop says, I burned in the unutterable beauty of being alive. We need to have a place and a journey that makes us feel alive. If we do not feel valued, the responsibilities that are a part of life will have a draining effect, which we can't recover from as quickly. And when we lose our resiliency, we feel helpless. The life we have becomes a grind. If you were to take a moment today to sit and pray, What would come to mind? Would you see opportunities to cultivate a more bountiful life? If you do, perhaps you could choose just one little movement that moves you in the right direction. Here's today's idea from a book called The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker. 131 ways to spark creativity, find inspiration, and discover joy in the everyday. Change is to could be. Adam Grant says, change is to could be and you become more mindful. In an essay that sought to expand the usual thinking about mindfulness, psychologist and writer Adam Grant described a practice called conditional thinking, or thinking in conditionals instead of absolutes. As an example, he pointed to an experiment in which subjects were given a handful of objects and asked to fix a problem that had been made in pencil. Each group got the same stuff. For one group, the object descriptions were narrow and specific. This is a rubber band, and so on. The other group heard slightly different descriptions, subtly ambiguous. For example, this could be a rubber band. The latter group 
Grant explains, was thus gently primed to think conditionally. Not to see what is, but to see what could be. And in the group of conditional thinkers, about 40% realized a rubber band can also be used as an eraser. In the group of absolute thinkers, only 3% had the same epiphany and were able to complete the task. Grant's rift, riff on conditional thinking reminded me of an acquaintance of mine who calls himself Rotten Apple. He's, design, he's a designer whose side work includes small scale but highly creative interventions that transform overlooked urban flotsam into useful or appealing elements of the pedestrian environment. For example, a clip-on seat could turn a bike stand into a chair. Discarded cutting boards converted into chess tables could be installed atop fire hydrants. Sudoku puzzles could be imposed on subway station tiles. A jump rope could be made of abandoned construction tape. Rotten Apple is an amazing additional thinker. On a casual walk through his neighborhood, he can reveal exploitable details of bike racks, explain how plastic traffic barriers are weighted by water, and stop mid-sentence to collect some stray milk crate or other discard for future use, always noting in effect what could be. You don't have to be a street designer to enjoy the benefits of conditional thinking. Looking for an answer instead of the answer can shift and broaden your vision. You know, this reminds me of um, some of my favorite comedians that can take ordinary everyday things and cause um, a spotlight to be put on it in a very um, practical but also very witty way. And I bet there are ways in your own life, I know there are in mine, where I can find a twist on things. I know when I started um, creating um, sewing kits for the kids in my classroom and then if I sell them online at Etsy. Um, what I loved about how that idea started is that in my training as a Montessori teacher, we taught um, preschoolers how to sew, which, you know, for some might seem, I don't know, a precarious task to have a four-year-old with a sewing needle in their hands. <laughs> but um, what I found is that children really do rise to the occasion of they understand and they respect the material which is a uh, a sharp needle and um, they just have a sense of confidence and trust in themselves because I trust them with something that would potentially be considered dangerous but anyway when I was making those um, um, lessons for my students, I started to see how really meditative and fun and simple um, these lessons were, but also how beautiful they were. And so from there, I created these patches. You would call them an iron-on patch, but you'd actually have to sew them on. But we created them as a fundraiser for the school where you'd simply buy it. It would have like the, the uh, fabric on it um, cut, um, like you would envision a patch on maybe your um, elbows or you know a, a hole in your jeans. Um, but what we would do instead is we would sew these simple figures on it, like um, our objects, like a mustache or a dragonfly or just a simple sweet flower. And um, I just remembered how beautiful it looked, but also just this outside of a box way of using something so ordinary like an iron-on patch, but instead of it being iron-on, it would be sewn-on. And it was something you wouldn't normally see. So it was like a conversation starter. And so it's just things like that where it's like, oh, that's 
it, it's like at first glance, it's like, ah, but as you think about it more, you you realize, oh, an invention is as easy as that, to see something in a different way, just for a moment. So I invite you today to kind of look around your life, your house, your relationships, see what could just maybe could be as opposed to is. Here's some ideas I'd like to share from you from a book by Mona Brooks called Drawing with Children, a creative method for adult beginners too, on setting an area for creativity. So whether it be for yourself or for um, your classroom if you're a teacher or if you have maybe um, children that you would like to set an area for as a, uh, a parent or a, uh, a fun aunt or uncle or uh, a grandparent, um, like to just give you some ideas to just kind of ease any overwhelm that you might be feeling. So the first thing you want to think about is a demonstration area. So I would say for me in the classroom, and even when I've worked, um, created um, birthday party experiences or worked in a community center, one of the first things I would look for is an area where I can demonstrate either on a whiteboard or on a, you know, anywhere. You, and you really can use anything. I actually create, um, I would bring my own portable um, whiteboard just in the event there wasn't a space for me to demonstrate, but I really have found that that's a very important part of helping others to create together with you. Um, so let's hear some words from, um, from Mona on this. The idea surface is a cork board on which you can pin large pieces of butcher paper for demonstration and have plenty of room left for graphic ideas and sample drawings. If all you have is a chalkboard, use masking tape to hang up large pieces of butcher paper. Chalk does not adapt well to the process of drawing, so you will need to demonstrate in marker or other media on paper. Overhead projectors are okay for simple abstract line drawings, but when you want to demonstrate color, realism, or shading, they are inadequate. At home, you simply want a space next to a child that allows her to see you your demonstration of the idea. In either setting, have a tall table or rolling cart available to set up a still life or objects to be drawn. The next thing to think about is seating and drawing surface. The tables in a classroom need to be arranged in a way that will allow all students to face the demonstration area. When choosing a space at home, you'll need a flat table surface. Have small children in chairs or booster seats that allow them to sit comfortably without being up on their knees or reaching up to the surface. Make a mat out of white tag board or heavy paper that will keep marker inks from bleeding through onto the table and will serve as a place to test colors. neatness. You will be learning to see the shapes of things and looking at a lot of visual data. Visual clutter can make it impossible for most people to focus. It is important to remove all items that do not relate to the drawing process. Have the children in the classroom remove all textbooks and other papers from their desks and clean away all the pinned up work and bulletin board items that surround your demonstration area. If you're working at home at your kitchen table, take time to clean everything off first. Trying to draw in the midst of newspapers, toasters, and dishes can cause too many distractions. So for right now, let's just consider this. Neatness, the seating and drawing surface, and your demonstration area. 
I can tell you from experience that all of these little, again, going back to the little details, really do set up for a better experience um, because there's something about really dedicating a space to learn something new that really allows all of your energy and focus to go into the task at hand. And so while this might seem like things that really don't matter, I know that for me, I would always give myself at least a good 20 minutes before any class and hopefully 30 if I had it to just walk a room and and look around and pay attention to anything that would move um, the attention from what it is that I want the students in front of me to be focused on and so that same holds true in a um, in a home environment um, anything that is around you that could cause you or the student um, to, to move and, and divert attention will more than likely divert the attention. It's very much like when you are in your own home and you want to try something new, but you know that there are dishes to be done. <laughs> and so many of us won't do the task we're needing to do because we need the dishes to be washed. And I know for me, um, because I do a lot of writing, I many times have to leave my home in order to do that as a freelancer. Because if I am in my home, the home represents, you know, something in my mind that diverts away from the task at hand, which is to just free flow and write, right? So I hope these are um, great um, tips for you, um, especially if you have tried something like this before and it hasn't really been as successful as you would like to, it to have been, here's maybe some things to think about for your, your next opportunity to um, be in the position to offer creative instruction. discuss the discipline of prayer. I'm going to use as a starting point an essay from Henry Nouwen in his book Spiritual Direction. And he talks about three components um, that go into um, disciplining yourself to pray or creating the discipline to pray. Prayer is not something that comes naturally or easily for most people. It's something that requires learning and discipline. This is true both for saying particular prayers and for remaining in a continuing attitude of prayerfulness. In learning to pray, it is important to set aside a definite, a definite time, a special place, and a single focus. Let's talk about a definite time. Our time for prayer should be in the morning or noonday, or at night. It could be for an hour, half hour, or 10 minutes. It could be once or more times each day. The important thing is to commit to a definite time during the day to be alone with God in prayer. The question is not should I pray, but when will I pray? Before you go to work, during a break in the middle of the day, at night before you fall asleep. Most people find that early in the morning is the best time of day to set aside for prayer, as Jesus did, as mentioned in Mark 135. If that is unrealistic, then set aside some other time during the day when God will get your full attention. Any half hour or so during the day is better than no time at all. Without a half hour of pray in the, prayer in the morning or at night, or 10 minutes of prayer during the day, 
or a brief prayer before dinner or after dinner, we begin to forget that God is near and that our life in God is a life of prayer. A special place. Once we've set aside our time for God, we are free to follow Jesus' words. Go to your private room, shut the door, and so pray to your Father who is in that secret place. Matthew 6.6 6. Not only time, but place is important in prayer. Choose a special place to pray the Psalms, meditate on the Word, or contemplate the glory of the Lord. Jesus often chose to climb a mountain, enter a garden, depart to the desert, or rest in a boat on the water to pray and listen to God. The Apostle Paul, when in the city of Philippi, looked for a special place of prayer along a riverbank, Acts 16.13. Outdoors or inside, wherever you are most comfortable, find a quiet and peaceful spot for prayer and meditation. The idea is to have a special room in your home to set aside for prayer. If such a room is decorated with images that speak about God, when there are some candles to light or perhaps some incense to burn, then you will more often want to be there. And the more you pray in such a place, the more that pray place will be filled with the energy and power of prayer. In such a place, it won't be hard to leave the world behind for a moment and let yourself be absorbed by the love of Jesus. In case you don't have a room to spare, find a, quote, prayer closet, unquote, or the corner of a room to set up an altar or claim a special chair for prayer. If that is not possible, try to go to a church or chapel where you feel safe and where you want to return. While it is true that you can pray anywhere, a particular time and a special place designated for regular solitary prayer is best. And finally, a single focus. What do you do during your time and place for prayer? The simple answer is just be with Jesus. Let him look at you, touch you, and speak to you. Believe that you are in God's presence. Speak in any way your heart desires. And learn to listen. Let God be the single focus of your time set apart to be in the presence of the Lord. For most of us, this simple answer is not enough. The complication is that as soon as we enter into solitude, we discover how tired and bored we are. Of course, if we are physically exhausted, we cannot pray. And the most spiritual thing we can do then is to take a nap. When we are bored, the time feels empty and useless. But why not spend some useless time in our busy days in prayer? Prayer is not being busy with God as opposed to being busy with someone or something else. Prayer is simply a useless hour to be with God. Not because I am so useless to God, but because I am not in control. If anything useful comes out of this prayer, my prayer, it is God who does it. Over time, our time spent with God may become more fruitful. But this is not of our doing. The time set apart for prayer is in our control, but the results are not. Once we are alert and ready for prayer, the thing to do is to find a focus. Read the gospel text for the day, sing a psalm, or pick out a verse of scripture and read it slowly. In all the great spiritual traditions, those who practice prayer or meditation have a single point of concentration. For Christians, the focus may be the name Jesus, or it may be the Jesus prayer, Lord have mercy. 
It may be a compelling image, a powerful word, or a phrase in scripture, something that commands your attention. The purpose of focusing your prayer is to free the mind to meditate with the heart and contemplate the glory of God. Thank you.